across the fence, we visit one of our nation's oldest gardens, which thanks to some rough and tumble Vermonters, also happens to be a turning point in American history. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. There was a time that if you controlled Fort Ticonderoga, you controlled a continent. The fort is on a narrow waterway that connects Lake George with Lake Champlain. It was the gateway between settlers in New France and British citizens in the American colonies. The building of the fort began in 1755 and it changed hands several times in its history. It was ultimately purchased and preserved by the Pell family, who turned Fort Ticonderoga into the museum it is today. It was Napoleon who said an army marches on its stomach, and the general's observation may be the reason why Fort Ticonderoga is home to the King's Garden. At one time, the acreage dedicated to the gardens at the fort was larger than the fort itself. We're going to join University of Vermont Extension horticulturalist Leonard Perry as he leads us in the footsteps of history on a tour of the gardens and grounds of Fort Ticonderoga. Well, Beth, I can see why they put a fort up here on this beautiful promontory. It is incredibly beautiful. Beth Hill is the president and CEO of Fort Ticonderoga. The 2,000 acres and 200 miles of shoreline on Lake Champlain that make up the grounds here cover over 250 years of history in North America. The fort was originally built by the French in 1755. It was held by the French, it was known as Fort Carrion. The epic struggle between England and France during the French Indian War took place here July 8, 1758. A stunning defeat for the British, over 17,000 troops defeated from 4,000 French soldiers. Uh, the British took the fort the next year in 1759 as the tide of the war was changing and of course the British won the French Indian War, won North American continent. Uh, they maintained the fort until May 10, 1775, when America's first victory took place here at Fort Ticonderoga. The Americans held the fort until the Burgoyne Campaign in 1777, when the British took the fort, and shortly after that was the turning point of the revolution and the defeat of the British at the Battle of Saratoga. We were also a significant site because we have had destination travelers coming here for more than two centuries, going back to Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, who came to the site in the early 1790s. And we've had sightseers uh, learn from the site and enjoy the beauty of the site since that point. Um, the restoration of the fort was groundbreaking in the profession. We led the way. National parks hadn't yet been established. Sites like Colonial Williamsburg weren't even a vision yet. And Fort Ticonderoga opened to the public in 1909. So in many ways, Leonard, we are significant in defining uh, our story as Americans. Now we find of quite a few examples of these guns. History lives at Fort Ticonderoga in daily programs and reenactments. From muskets, and marches. To more domestic pursuits, there is certainly something for everyone. We have a thriving historic trades program so folks can come in and learn about how the clothing was made, how they made their shoes, where they uh, purchased the cloth, uh, and, and the daily life of the soldiers here at the fort. We do many living history weekends, uh, a battle reenactment every July, the third weekend in July, but tons of other events offered throughout uh, the season and really throughout the year. We offer programs related to our history and a really diversified experience including the garden, exhibitions, collections. Because of the beauty of the site, it, it really is it is an amazing, immersive experience for our visitors. Which of these gardens do you enjoy the most? Well, I really enjoy this children's garden, Leonard, because it changes. Heidi Karkowski is the director of horticulture at Fort Ticonderoga. She gave us a tour of the gardens and talked about the significance of agriculture at the fort now and then. 
In the 18th century, the soldiers who built the fort here also had a garden, and that was the first garden that was planted here. And now this garden is one of the oldest gardens in North America and the largest public garden in the Adirondack and Lake Champlain region. This garden really is steeped in history and has many layers. So the first garden layer would be that garrison garden that I mentioned. Later, this same land was used and was a celebrated arboretum. There were cutting gardens and vegetable gardens here throughout the centuries that served travelers and visitors. And then eventually a colonial revival garden and then the garden that you see here today. Regiments were assigned specific plots and soldiers who volunteered to tend the gardens would have received extra pay for their work. Well, in the 18th century, forts did have gardens because it was really important to have a ready source of fresh vegetables to try to keep the soldiers healthy. And it was a really long trip from France or England to bring supplies, so to have them readily available right at the fort was really ideal. It was actually a very extensive garden here, and the footprint was about the same size as the fort itself, so a very large garden. And the things that they grew would supplement the rations that were available to the soldiers, so it was very important that they had fresh vegetables to go along with the dried breads and the dried meats and the very bland items that would have been part of a soldier's rations. Today, not too far from where those rows of crops were grown, is a garden where visitors of all ages can cultivate ideas for their own gardens. Well, we're standing in one of our discovery gardens, and this is the children's garden. It is for the young and also the young at heart, where we grow flowers and vegetables combined in um, little vignettes areas to attract birds and butterflies, a sunflower house, child-sized Adirondack chairs. So an opportunity for, to get up close and personal with the plants and learn about them. I do try to find and uh, repurpose items in the garden because it shows that you can be creative and do things that are different, maybe from something that you have right in your own garage. Another garden that sparks ideas for visitors is this planting of ornamental grasses interspersed with vegetables. Well, this area is our monocots in the round. So these are all grasses and related to grasses. We have broom corn, we have millet, we have a couple of really nice ornamental grasses. We also have some onions growing in here. So something just a little bit different, but it's also decorative. Fort Ticonderoga's dedication to preservation extends to the history that happened here long before Europeans came to North America. The third garden is our Three Sisters Garden, where we grow corn, beans, and squash together in the way that Native Americans did. That garden celebrates the people who were here before there was a fort. The Pell family's stewardship of this property has been ongoing since it was purchased in 1820. Sarah Gibbs Thompson married into the Pell family in 1901. By all accounts, this well-known suffragette was as passionate about her politics as the need for historic preservation. When it came time to renovate this walled 19th century pleasure garden, Pell hired Marion Kruger Coffin. A leading light in her own right, Coffin was a graduate of MIT and the first American woman academically trained as a landscape architect. Their work on what is now referred to as the King's Garden has been named a Masterwork American Garden by the Garden Conservancy. Well, Heidi, we're inside a walled garden now. Looks very different from the gardens outside. Tell us about these. That's right, Leonard. You're standing in a colonial revival garden. The soldiers grew a colonial garden that was very practical, um, but this is a pleasure garden. So the colonial revival takes the best elements from the 18th century gardens and incorporates them into a beautiful garden. But this garden was not of that period. This was actually in the, later in the last century, right? That's right. This garden was created in the 1920s for the museum's founders, Stephen and Sarah Pell. They hired Marion Kruger Coffin to design this walled garden. It contains 32 flower beds and is filled with annuals and perennials. 
Well, it looks like you've got quite a few different uh, annuals in here. Um, more than a dozen, I'd say. We do. We, we actually uh, had 267 unique plants um, installed this year in all of our gardens combined. So it's a big number. Um, those but are it, different varieties. Different not, varieties, so it gives just, the visitor uh, yeah. a lot to see. So quite a few hundred plants you're planting here, and that's just the annuals. And you've got perennials in here too, it looks like, the tiger lilies and the phlox. Yes, that's true. They're the backbone of the garden, and the annuals supplement those each year. Right, and tell us about the plants. Are these um, the plants that they actually, were these exact plants, obviously not the annuals, but the perennials, the ones from the 1920s? Or how do you um, try to get some of these plants in the garden? Well, when this garden was restored in the late 1990s, the uh, fort has the planting plan from Marion Coffin in our collection. So we were able to use that plan to recreate this garden. But of course, not all the plants that were available to Marion Coffin are available now, so some substitutions do have to be made, but that does allow us to use the best of the old and the best of the new here in this garden. So you may not have the exact cultivar that they had back then, but if it's maybe a salvia like these along here, um, I assume are you calling this a hummingbird sage? I assume they're hummingbirds. Looks Definitely. like it'd be attractive to them, being red and tubular, but it's just a great plant to line the walks, but I assume they would have that, maybe not this cultivar, though, that you're using, a cultivated variety. That's right. We do use modern cultivars when a historic plant is not available. We do have some perennials that are left over from the 1920s. One of my particular favorites is a bearded iris called Iris King that blooms hmm. in the spring. Wow, so you mentioned spring. I assume this looks gorgeous now, but it must look gorgeous right through the season with these others. I noticed some peony plants outside, obviously not in bloom now. Right. But. Well, the garden was designed to bloom throughout the season, so really every two weeks it feels like a new garden with the progression that takes place. We open on June 1st, uh, start off with the bearded iris, the oriental poppies, and the peonies, and then segue each uh, month through the changing garden of annuals and perennials. Um, the tiger lilies are particularly beautiful right now. And then moving into the fall, we'll have um, another progression of blooming plants that are happening. I well, know uh, Marion Kruger Coffin was a very famous, I think what, one of the first women landscape architects, is that correct? That's correct. She was groundbreaking in her field. So it was really um, unique to have a woman design this garden. And then the other thing unique, it seems, um, is the warm colors at this end and the cool colors at that end. Could you tell us about that? Sure. That's actually one of Coffin's hallmarks. Uh, she was known for her wise use of color, and she uh, separated this garden with those um, color palette, and it really gives the feeling of two separate gardens almost. So basically, if you're at the house and you look down here, this seems to be a bit closer even as warm colors tend to it visually does. come closer. And also, it would be very attractive to uh, to want to come down and see this part I of the garden. I think the warm end really does beckon people to come and explore it. And that cool end is so peaceful and relaxing with the whites and the pinks and the lavenders. And you mentioned the garden's changing uh, through the season. I know you uh, have events. Could you tell us about those through the season? We do have events all season long, tours and programs for adults and children. We have a fabulous garden party. Uh, we have a corn maze that opens in the late summer, and we also have a harvest festival that happens in the fall. Great. Well, thank you so much, Heidi, for sharing some time with us today in these beautiful gardens. You're welcome. And thank you for watching today on Across the Fence. For University of Vermont Extension, I'm Leonard Perry. Well, thank you, Leonard. Fort Ticonderoga is open mid-May to mid-October. You can find specific details, including admission cost, on the website fortticonderoga.org. Full-scale reenactments are a part of the fort's educational mission, and you'll find musket and fife and drum demonstrations taking place every day. The fort also offers programs for families and educational opportunities for teachers. Again, for information, check the website or you can call the number. It's 518-585-2821. That's 518-585-2821. Well, that's our program for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.